Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. You're going to love today's episode, which I always say every week because I know you're going to love all of them. With me today is Megan Bang. She is a nurse who is going to talk to us about cannabis and chronic illnesses, but more specifically dementia and maybe some research that's come up lately and to see how maybe this might fit into our caregiving routine. So thanks for joining me, Megan. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Awesome. So please introduce yourself a little more and tell everybody about your background. Sure. My name is Megan Bang. I'm a registered nurse. I've been a nurse for 11 years now. I started my career at Johns Hopkins Hospital and the bone marrow transplant unit. And then I switched to labor and delivery. And then my last bedside stint was um, hospice and palliative care. Um, and then from there, when I was working hospice, I just saw the benefits of cannabis and CBD in my patient population. I had this patient who kept having seizures and she was on five or six different seizure medications, of course, having side effects from those medications. And, um, and I knew we had to like try something. I had read the headlines about CBD and cannabis and seizures, but I didn't know anything about it. It's not anything that we were taught in in the field or in school or anything. So I just decided to jump in the deep end and start learning everything I could. I started going to conferences. I started a graduate program. I am five and a half weeks from a master's degree in medical cannabis therapeutics right now. And I started my business called Trusted Canna Nurse, where we teach people how to use cannabis, CBD, and psychedelics as medicine. And so we kind of hold, hold people's hand while they're navigating plant medicine. And then we have a, a very high quality line of CBD products that we can offer directly to our patients nationwide. Awesome. I did not know there was a master's degree in cannabis, anything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think there I've been are, out of school too programs. long. <laughs> I would expect that, that to be available at like Berkeley, but that's just a really bad stereotype that I should probably not indulge in. <laughs> but I am from that area ge generally, so I can, I can poke a little fun. Yeah. So I know a lot of caregivers use um, cannabis, generally edibles, to help their loved ones sleep through the night because as you're aware, I'm sure that um, dementia throws off your sleep schedule. I mean, your brain doesn't know day from night, half the time mm -hmm. sometimes. And of course, caregivers need rest so they can continue caregiving just like nurses do. <laughs> um, what other benefits are there for somebody caring for a loved one with Alzheimer's or other cognitive impairment disease, how, how can they, one, learn more, obviously that's what we're gonna talk about today, mm -hmm. but what, what can they do, what can they look into for their loved ones? Because I know some, about 60%, no, that's wandering, a good number of people with Alzheimer's get aggressive. Uh, my mom started to get, she was getting a little aggressive, very very feisty at the end of her life um i don't know that i would have i don't know i might have tried cannabis for her but she fell and broke her leg before mm. it got to the point where i felt like we needed to investigate some alternatives and i also don't know how the memory care would have dealt with that so we never experimented around with that with my mom but what what should caregivers be thinking about with um with cannabis yeah, great, great questions. And I'll, I'll go back to the sleep a little bit, because I think sleep is just so important for both patient and caregiver. And a lot of times when we can target sleep and we target sleep mostly with THC, CBD actually doesn't work that well for sleep. It's not sedating. It's uh, THC that has that sedating effect. So that's why, you know, a couple of milligrams of THC, usually in a gummy or a tincture, work really, really well for a lot of people for sleep. And then when we're targeting sleep and the patient is getting better sleep, then their daytimes are usually a lot better too because they're not overtired. And you know, same thing with, with kids. We see that, right? Um, so that's, that's one thing. You know, we're targeting the symptoms of 
of the neurodegeneration. And agitation and anxiety are the other two big ones. And that can be targeted with CBD during the daytime. Uh, something like a high quality whole plant CBD product. Maybe you have some other cannabinoids. A cannabinoid is CBD or THC, or there are like 150 more that come from the plant. And there's about a dozen or so on the market. And as a nurse, that's something I know what each one targets, what receptors they act on, and then the effect that they're going to have. So that's when I say, I kind of like walk people through, let's try CBD, maybe a little bit of CBN and let's throw in some terpenes. That's what makes like the indica sativa in cannabis. Let's throw in some calming terpenes and see if we can't get this patient a little bit more relaxed during the day. Yeah, that's, um, so one of the things I do for the Alzheimer's Association is community education. And one of my topics is common dementia related behaviors and agitation is obviously one of them. And the steps they tell us to take is, you know, obviously we need to like connect with the loved one, put on our detective hat, see if we can figure out what's going on and then address their physical needs first. You know, could they have a UTI? Could they be having a reaction to medications? Any of those kind of things. And I find with agitation, there's usually more of an emotional trigger, which is the third step. But sometimes, you know, to get them from point A to point B, so you can kind of suss out the emotional triggers. Like one of the examples they give is this one particular woman is pacing in her house at night saying, I need to go, I need to go. And she's lost weight because she's walking so much. She's getting blisters from worn out shoes. So obviously you need to address those things. But the other main clue in the little scenario they give for a talk is that she was a nurse in the overnight shift for 40 years. So obviously the woman <sighs> thinks she's got to go to work. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. He, and her circadian rhythm is like, yes. Messed up. <laughs> Still flopped. Yes. Very messed up. And so that kind of scenario, I think, would um, probably benefit, like, if you're not able to, like, ratchet down the agitation so that you can then work on somehow convincing her she does not need to go to work, <laughs> that that's more of a challenge, I think, than the physical parts. But I would think that would be a good place to look into, did you say CBN? CBD, CBN, um, CBG is a great one. That's called cannabigerol. And what's great about CBG is it acts on our alpha two adrenergic receptors. And these are receptors that are involved in our fight or flight response. So it's really great for physical symptoms of anxiety. So that's, um, so yeah. And then in working with patients, you know, we, we try to keep it as simple as possible. Let's try a little bit of THC at night. Let's try a little bit of CBD during the day and then see just see how that works and then adjust if we need to. And what we have seen is that consistent dosing over time yields the best results as opposed to, I'm not going to give it to her unless she's actually agitated. And here's why, here's why we like consistent dosing over time is because in neurodegenerative diseases, the brain has pretty bad neuroinflammation and oxidative stress. And neuroinflammation, we're talking about cytokines. And like this, like it's not a cytokine storm per se, but there are like these neuroinflammatory cytokines in the brain, and those cause damage and more degeneration and a lot of the symptoms that we see. These are the same symptoms that we see in concussion victims. And the great thing about cannabinoids like CBD, CBG, THC, is that they decrease those cytokines in the brain. And then we have those same cannabinoids can gobble up the free radicals that cause that oxidative stress and neurodegeneration. So that also helps with the symptoms. And then it can do that body-wide too and help with any symptoms of pain that the patient might be feeling that we don't know about. I read a study, and this is not the one I was talking about before we hit record. Mm -hmm. I read a lot, <laughs> is that in older adults, which I probably am at least, if I'm not classified that I'm getting dang close. <laughs> um, they're basically neurologists are saying there's no amount of alcohol or THC that's safe for your brain. But I've talked to other, um, I have not talked to a medical professional about cannabis. So this is an excellent topic for today. 
with you, obviously. That's the whole plan. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I've talked to like cannabis lifestyle people who are very big on like micro dosing for very specific things, which is probably similar to what you do. Um, you know, my, my theory with, if you've already got Alzheimer's, you don't want to make it worse, but, um, you know, you're saying that it, it could benefit the brain. And then I'm reading that it's not a good idea. It's like, it's so typical, you know, like you get to the point where it's like, well, breathing is dangerous for yourself. So stop doing that. Right. Right. Do you yeah, have a, that, a, go ahead. Absolutely. I mean, you have to look at who's writing it and what experience do they have? Are they educated on the endocannabinoid system, which is this system that we have in our bodies that was only discovered 30 years ago. And this is a system that is responsible for homeostasis. It's the body's master regulatory system. And this is what turns the volume down on neurotransmitters that are released in a stressful event. Our endocannabinoid system kicks in and it kind of helps us get back to baseline after that stressful event. If this system is out of whack for whatever reason, chronic stress, an injury, chronic illness, then and that system can't maintain balance in the body. However, receptors involved in the system called cannabinoid receptors, THC is the only molecule that binds to these cannabinoid receptors. I mean, we make our own that bind to that as well, but THC is the only one that binds to it. So if we want to release or reduce the amount of glutamate, harmful um excitatory glutamate that our brain is releasing, then we need a little bit of THC to turn the volume down on the glutamate and the inflammatory cytokines. So while I am not a proponent proponent of chronic use of high THC, people sucking on their vape pens every day, that's not exactly, that's not at all what we're talking about. We're talking about small, low doses of THC. And we're seeing that that helps with symptom management. And um, there was a mouse study done of course, we get, this is this would be really hard to study in humans. But there was a mouse study done, and they gave they gave CBD and THC, I believe, is what they gave. They induced like the tau proteins, you know, that are in dementia and Alzheimer's. Um, they induced this state in the in the rats, and then they gave cannabinoids, cannabis, and then they found that like those proteins were decreased in these mm. rat brains. So in a way, like we're not reversing the disease, but we're not accelerating it. And I mean, we could be, there could be potential. And I have a patient story uh, with this. Also, this is a patient, dementia patient in Florida. He had been on cannabis for a while since the start of his um, symptoms about five years ago. And, and he was doing fairly well. However, when the kids would come over, he would still be like in the corner, kind of withdrawn, despondent, uh, reading a book, doing word searches, engaging with the kids was just not in his, you know, in, in his vision at all. And then he started, he started one of our products and within a couple of months, he's like, he's doing word searches and he's able to read and he's doing bird watching and he's like playing Uno with his grandkids and engaging with his grandkids. And we can't say he's reversing the disease, but he's getting back closer to where he was instead of the disease progressing. So in the broad sense, what he's experiencing is potentially what people that are taking Lakembi could be experiencing. Could be, yeah. Without yeah. without the large pharmaceutical bill. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And he's not on any, I mean, maybe he's on a blood pressure med or something, but otherwise he's not on any of the dementia pills. And, you know, there are seven FDA approved dementia medications, but none of them actually target the symptoms. So we have to use like antipsychotics off label that have this black box warning for our dementia patients. And it's not safe. We don't want, we don't want our loved ones snowed all day on Seroquel because they're agitated. And I've seen that. I just saw that with a patient last week. Yeah. Sometimes when people get aggressive and a bit obnoxious. That's kind of the only option a lot of them have. I know somebody whose loved one is in memory care. It's been a recent placement and they don't like it. You know, they're still resisting. 
Yeah. And, yeah. Um, <clears throat> she, the, the caregiver, the family member said, I'd rather this person be more like a zombie than nasty, but the increased dose of the Seroquel has not made her a zombie, but you do have to keep increasing it because you build up a tolerance. So that's, it's only, that only sounds like a temporary fix. I mean, I don't know how much Seroquel you can give somebody, but this person's loved one is advanced age. So, you know, you, sometimes you got to race, you're racing the clock on the, you know, end of life with my mom who'd had Alzheimer's for 20 years. My goal was not to do anything that would extend dying from Alzheimer's because we all know that's pretty ugly. And she helped out so by falling hard. and breaking her legs. <laughs> that was the end of that for her. Um, I, you know, you hear people about breaking hips. I didn't realize breaking a leg would have been the last straw, but it, the timing was good because it was right at the start of the pandemic. So I didn't have to deal with wow. any of that. Yeah, it'll be. So we're recording this on March 12th. She died March 31st. So Easter this wow. year. Wow. Um, I can't believe it's been four years. Like, holy it's Isn't like crazy. That crazy? <laughs> It's like, yeah, it's like, I have no idea where time is going, but that's okay. We'll just keep, keep going forward. But yeah, yep. that I don't, is there a max amount of Seroquel you can give someone? Uh, it's been a while. I know that, <laughs> I don't know what the max is. I'm sure there is. And the risk of high doses of Seroquel are like, one of them is called tardive dyskinesia, which is when you have like these involuntary twitches and movements and muscle spasms. And that's not improving quality of life for these patients no. that's decreasing and if we have something that's like a natural plant that can be given without that side effect then why can't we like, like give that that natural medicine because we still have a bias and a stereotype against this quote-unquote plant-based medication <laughs> absolutely yeah yeah and it is you know cannabis is federally illegal CBD is federally legal. Um, and a lot of people don't, a lot of facilities and communities think that if their patients are using CBD or cannabis, then they're going to lose their Medicare funding, which is false. Uh, Medicare has come out and said, we don't care if your patients are using cannabis or CBD. Don't let them light up when they're using oxygen. <laughs> Make sure they're like, their stuff is stored in a safe place so their neighbors don't come in and steal it. You know, so their Medicare is okay with senior living communities using their own cannabis and CBD, as long as they're treating it like the medication, like the medicine that it is. Wouldn't it be better in a, in a assisted living memory care community for it to be more of an edible or I don't know, do they even make it in like quote pill form? They do make capsules. Um, you can put, this is what I like to do with our CBD is like, you can just take an empty capsule and put some oil in here. Oh, that would work. Cap it up. Yeah. Yeah. So that works really well. Or you can just give them an oil. Edibles work well. Um, inhaling. There are a couple ways to inhale that include like the little vape pens that you see everywhere. Of course, there are joints that people smoke. And then there's a device called a dry herb vaporizer, which is when you take raw ground up flour and you put it in this device and then it just heats it up a little bit not to the point of combustion um and then you inhale it and it's like almost inhaling steam and the benefit of that is a super rapid onset you know within a few minutes all of the other routes take 15 45 up to an hour or two for an edible to kick in um, but an inhalation method is like super rapid onset and a shorter duration. So if somebody has acute symptoms, and this is probably like for people who are like at home and not in a facility, but they do have like an inhalation method has a therapeutic benefit. Definitely. Well, you're kind of deep breathing. So that's a start right there, right? Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've never been a smoker. So <laughs> I have done edibles and I have done tinctures and I have done, I got shingles in 2021. Mm. I used a topical ointment, which helped tremendously because Good. of course the doctor's like, oh, take Motrin. It's like, really? Motrin this doesn't do it. And again, it's like the, the nerves that are firing and releasing those, you know, the burning, all of those, um, the molecules that make it burn, like Motrin doesn't target those. 
However, cannabis does and can decrease the firing of those neurotransmitters. Yeah, it helped a lot. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) And she, you know, then after I'd had it for like three months, and I'm like, this is affecting my mental health because literally there were just days when like late afternoon i just it's like you can almost see like a personality shift it's like my tolerance for this is over and i have a pretty high mm-hmm. pain tolerance but it was getting ugly and she's like well now you can have the um gabapentin and i'm like i thought it was a narcotic my dog was on it because he had serious nerve arthritis but i'm like it's been three and a half months i don't think i think it's a little late to start on the <sighs> hardcore stuff I'll just deal with it. So it was like another month, so about four, mm. four and a half months. You know, I mean, it wasn't it decreased over time, but oh lord, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. The the topical roll on stuff was really good. Unfortunately, they ran out of the higher milligram stuff, mm-hmm. and the the second batch of stuff I got wasn't quite as good. But you know, it worked really good. I took a a gummy and then a tincture, and then I. St- it up after watching tv i was like oh whoops i think i might have had a little too much there <laughs> but i felt felt much better and slept better so because <laughs> of course i'm a side sleeper and it was on the side that i sleep on so yeah it was oh. just like ugh yeah so that's yeah. that's pretty much my the, the maximum of my experiences i'm i don't drink because i don't drink calories and i every time i pass the dispensary i'm like maybe i should go like get go back to that i'm like yeah it's expensive so I am super frugal, right. so I just stick yeah. to I just stick to normal stuff. So, yeah. what other? Yeah, it's like I I can I know how to relax. I don't I don't I don't think I need outside help with that. Usually there are days, but for the most part, um. So you're you're basically saying that it's small doses. So like the person I talked to about microdosing is that about what you're talking about, or is it a little bit more than micro? <laughs> Right. Okay. So when we talk about microdosing, we could be referring to two different things. Um, You know, as a business, we have what we call microdosing programs, and that's when we're helping people microdose magic mushrooms or psilocybin, which is like the next big thing in mental health. And we actually have a dementia patient who is doing that. And he has, he's already on cannabis. Um, He's on some pretty decent doses of it. And then the microdosing of the mushrooms is also helping to calm him down during the day. Um, so he's doing that, but microdosing cannabis is a thing too. And that's when we're talking about like one to two, like maybe three milligrams of THC. And for a lot of my senior patients, our, you know, we have gummies that have three milligrams or six milligrams of THC. And those usually work really well. I had a patient who had shingles and she was taking one of our gummies during the daytime and at night. And she said that she could sleep because she wasn't in pain. And it's because the THC targets those specific receptors. I did use gummies once for agitation, but it wasn't for myself. It was for my dog. So I had a dog, a golden mm-hmm. retriever. He was a rescue and we like to travel in our trailer. Our girl dog, who is older, um, does not care where we're going. As long as there's food and people to pet her, she don't care. She will go to the vet. She will go to the, the nursery. She will go to Michael's. She would go to the grocery store and the nail shop if that was, you know, allowed. She don't care. Him hated it. It's like, oh, crap. You could just see. And he would just tremble and shake. Mm-hmm. And we tried, like, the pet CBD and then the stronger CBD. We were gone for three weeks in 21. And it got to the point where it's like, dog, chew on one of these. <laughs> that worked. <laughs> yes, yes. And like, pets have an endocannabinoid system too. And, you know, people read online that like THC is toxic for dogs, but a small amount can be really therapeutic as you saw. And my dog had like similar agitation, only hers was like on a normal daily basis. And so we gave her a small, a small amount of THC too. And it, it worked for her. She had a better quality of life. Yeah. He was much better in the car when we gave him a gummy, it might've been a little, I can't remember if it was five milligrams or 10, but he wasn't that big a dog. He's like 60 pounds. So 10 might've been a little much. <laughs> right, right. Um, but you know, it was like desperate times cause it was at the same time I had shingles. So he was getting my stuff. We were sharing. Oh uh, yeah, good. <laughs> it's just, you know, so it's interesting. So this patient that you have that's on cannabis and the psilocybin mushrooms, mm-hmm. Is he having like normal, without it, he's having what, severe agitation and anxiety? 
Yes. Yeah. That's, those are two of his biggest issues. Um, and then he has insomnia also, of course. Yeah. So the, the trifecta, and then I think, I don't know what your opinion is, but I think that what we see manifest manifesting in dementia is oftentimes related to unresolved trauma earlier in life. Um, you know, you see that with war veterans who are extremely, they have really bad agitation and they're very combative. And I think that that, that could be from their time, their PTSD from the war, um, or when they fought or whatever they went through. Um, of course that's not proven or research or anything, but that's just my mind thinking like, why do some people exhibit like really agitated, combative behavior. And some people are just a little bit more pleasant. And is it because there are these hidden memories in the brain that have been stuffed down for so long that now in dementia, are they coming, are they making their way to the forefront and causing these issues? I don't it know. Do you have be. an opinion? Yeah. The, so I've read, and I think my mom fell in this category is that um, even like mild untreated depression. So like, uh, you know, like you're just, well, I, I, the way I relate her issue to is like, she graduated high school at 17 and a half, wanted to go to San Francisco to the fashion Institute. Her parents are like, you know, we're from the suburbs. Like, Oh, hell no. And we're not sending 17 year old to San Francisco. Um, which of course I did. But, <laughs> um, and then like she married my dad at 19 and it just, I just feel like she had like this constant, frustration like i i want to do this and no you can't do that because you know parents won't let you or you got to take care of the younger siblings or you know you got to deal with the husband who my dad was in the marines the first two years they were married and then i came along so they got married in 62 i was born at the end of 66 so like almost five years later um you know and just it's like some people would be like, that's just life. You know, it's how life rolls out. You know, you don't know what would have happened if she'd gone to the Fashion Institute and da, da, da. Maybe she would have flunked out and life would have been terrible. But it just, it just seems like sometimes, because I've experienced this where you're like kind of hitting the wall all the time. It's like, why? It's like, this is a good thing I'm trying to do. Why is this so complicated? Why, why are people fighting me on this? Or, you know, why are they not stepping up and helping? So I, I do think that like, unresolved depression frustrations it can't be good for your brain we know stress is terrible for us and i think that's just a, a different flavor of stress so I, I i agree with you yeah yeah i think that that's that's completely valid that you know what happened in the past it like it doesn't it doesn't go away right it stays in our brain and a lot of times it manifests as chronic illness in the body and then i think we see it we could see it later on with dementia. <laughs> Brains are so complicated. <laughs> They're so oh, fascinating. Right, right. When people say, oh, we haven't conquered the last frontier, and, you know, they're generally talking about space, it's like, oh, no, no, the last frontier is our brains. When they conquer that, Lord only knows what humanity will be like. I am certain I will not be around at that point. <laughs> so I think we have a very long way to go on that. But we're, we seem to have made some progress in my life. So that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. We just yeah. need to, we need to, it seems like we need to, I don't know how you like throw off the shackles on research, like on plant-based medications, like we're talking about without unleashing God knows what, because humans are really good about screwing stuff up. <laughs> right. Right. And that's a great point to bring up too, is like the research with cannabis and where does big pharma fall in? And, you know, cannabis is the most studied drug in the world. There are, I think, around 35,000 peer review papers written on it. And when it comes to big pharma, so the, the, the cannabis plant has over 500 bioactive chemicals, I meaning like chemicals that react some way in our body, 500 of them in a plant. That's and a lot. That's, that's a lot, <laughs> right? And they all work together synergistically to help us. It's not just the THC or the CBD. It's like the terpenes, the flavonoids, and then like the, the chlorophylls in the plant, like all of these like really great things. So that's something you can't patent that can't patent this thing with over 500 chemicals. So there's no, 
there's no reason to invest money in a product to go through the FDA pathway, right? Because just just to submit an application for drug approval is four million dollars right now. Just some pocket change, <laughs> right? Right, it's pocket change for big drug companies. So what the drug companies are are going to do is they're going to isolate single compounds of the plant, like. CBD, they have done that with the medication of Epidiolex. With THC, they've done that with the medication called Marinol. They've taken THC and then they synthesize it, they make it in a lab. And then they can do that with these other compounds from the plant and then make a medication and then that patent it so that they can get their return on investment back and then have that go through the FDA pathway. Uh, the great thing about that is that's something that could be covered by insurance later, because of course, cannabis and CBD aren't covered by insurance, but you're missing the other 499 amazing parts of the plant in that medication. So that's why I really like whole plant formulations that include the hundreds of different bioactive chemicals, and they're going to be more effective at a lower dose than a single compound pharmaceutical. My understanding is the synthesized plant drugs, so like the Marinol, really mm -hmm. doesn't work as well as yeah, whatever, yeah, an edible right. it or... Doesn't, it doesn't work as well, and it has more side effects. And it's because it is purified THC. There's nothing in there to help balance the THC out. So you're going from like a whole, whole based, you know, I'm thinking like food. So you're like natural versus highly processed. <laughs> yes, yes. Or I like to think of it like like a salad. You know, if you're taking like like Marinol would be like just a bowl full of lettuce, right? It's only going to be as effective as a bowl full of lettuce. But if you have a tincture kind of like like this one, this has six different cannabinoids called Thrive and and terpenes and flavonoids. Like this is like your gourmet dinner salad with your your fruits, your vegetables, your meats, cheeses, dressing, nuts, seeds, like all the wonderful things on it. And of course, that's like, you could eat half of that and be full. That's gonna do its job, right? As opposed to just a bowl full of iceberg lettuce, which is kind of like the equivalent of Marinol almost. I could see that. So is there benefits for somebody? So my mom had Alzheimer's for 20 years. My maternal grandmother had vascular dementia and probably also Alzheimer's. My maternal great-grandmother also had some form of dementia. Yay for me. Um, is there like a brain health benefit from any of the products that you're working with? Not yeah. that I need to take any more freaking supplements, but. <laughs> <laughs> great, great question. This is actually an assignment I had to do for grad school is that you have a patient coming to you with a family history of dementia. They want to know what they can do. Uh, we don't have research to say, yes, you should be taking this product or this combination. Um, we just don't have that research. But I would say something like just a low dose whole plant CBD product that you take regularly, that could definitely help your brain like by decreasing that inflammation and potentially stopping the buildup of those plaques and proteins and stopping the neurons from breaking down, you know, in those tangles. I need to get a baseline on my brain because <laughs> I have no, um, I have no concerns about my cognitive health and I do all mm -hmm. the lifestyle stuff, exercise, sleep yeah, good, yeah. blah, blah, blah. Like I'm not, the only thing I don't do is I don't eat fish. I can't stand any kind of fish. So I take a very high dose curl oil supplement. Mm -hmm. um, if somebody said they'd promise I'd never get Alzheimer's if I ate salmon, oh, I do it, but I wouldn't like it at all. Mm -hmm. It would be, mm -hmm. I don't know if it'd be counterintuitive because you know, it would be unpleasant, but I would find a way if I, if that was a guarantee, but thankfully it's not. So I just, you know, I'd, you know, eat, really healthy, as healthy as one can eat in modern days. You know, it's like, right, I don't right. grow everything. I live in a part of California where there's lots of deer. So if you want to grow stuff, you got to, first you got to build your garden jail to keep the deer out. Yep. So it's just like, eh, that's a lot of work for unknown, unknown results. Is what else should a caregiver like myself in the past 
what what typical behaviors should we one you know investigate physical issues and then emotional issues but when sh what behaviors should we like say hey maybe i should talk to megan about this see what mm -hmm. see what they've got going on for we've talked about agitation we've talked about sleep i don't know if there's any plant-based medication for wandering <laughs> <laughs> that, I mean, that would... that's kind of like the, the that could be anxiety related wandering. Um, also, if people are wandering, is it because their bodies just need to move? You know, like like our bodies feel good when we're moving and when we're exercising. And is that what they're experiencing as well? Is it beneficial to help them move? Of course, with the woman who's like up all night wandering, that's not that's not good. You know, we want to not make if she's sure that... losing losing weight, not eating. <laughs> right. That is not contributing to anything. But, um, but, you know, I had one patient last week who he was agitated and just wanted to get up. So they just took him outside for a walk and then he was calm after that. So is, is just moving the body beneficial as humans, we should be moving our bodies anyways, as much as we can. Um, but so yeah, anxiety is one thing. And then, yeah, targeting the sleep. And also when, when the symptoms come on that can't be managed holistically, like with all of the interventions that we're doing, they're still having a problem, you know, then the doctor's like, okay, let's try this medication. And then that's when the family gets to decide, do we want to try a pharmaceutical or do we want to try something natural first? Or do we want to try both of them? You know, we do have patients on, on both and it, that's what works for them. So that's the, you know, that's when the family just has to kind of decide how they, how they want to best manage the symptoms. There's a lot, lots of, it's like, I, like I've been, I've been doing this for seven years. Like I said, my mom's been gone for four and I'm still learning all kinds of stuff, which is obviously good for my brain. There's, I wish I had known a lot of this six, seven years ago, mm -hmm. but that's okay. Um, I'm trying to I, think I wish if... I had known this when I worked <laughs> hospice. Like I didn't yeah. even know all this when I worked hospice and I could have helped so many patients. Would, um, cannabis be maybe not a better option, but an alternative to the morphine? Yes. Yes. Cannabis can be so great for the end of life symptoms. THC, if anybody, you know, the, if you've used THC, you know, it gives you a little bit of a dry mouth. That can be great for end of life when people have all of the excess secretions and it can help with that, that body wide pain that people feel, you know, we just move an arm and they're moaning in pain. It can really help with that. Just a small amount of THC. We're typically doing THC at that point because it is, you know, the most potent. So something like a little bit of oil, like rubbed on the tongue or on the gums can really help. Um, and then it can help to just like morphine can help open up the airways then um, THC can help open up the airways as well. We actually had cannabis was the first inhaler before we had albuterol. People were given joints to smoke instead, like before we had albuterol and it helped with asthma. That kind of blows my mind. I've had bronchitis enough that I've got occasional lung issues and I thought, I thought I was smoking a joint instead of using an inhaler. My that's going to take a minute to wrap my head Isn't around that wild. Yeah. <laughs> and it's because of the THC in there binds to those receptors and it opens up the airways. Interesting. Yeah. So of course, ever... right, right. Chronic smoking though, like you're smoking a bunch of times a day for a number of years that can lead to chronic bronchitis and like this kind of wet sounding cough that goes away after people use, but there's no increased risk of lung cancer with smoking cannabis, which is really fascinating. Um, and people with COPD could benefit too, because it can help open up their airways and dry up some of those secretions. That's wild. I know somebody that has COPD, but I don't, well, he might, he, I, I'm not sure he's ever been told that that's an option, but that's wild. Probably not. Yeah. Is that wild? <laughs> It's, you know, that's where the stereotype, it's like, you know, you think of people who are smoking marijuana, cannabis, you know, you get a vent, ment at least I get a mental picture. I'm sure most of the listeners get a mental picture that isn't necessarily accurate. And, you know, you're, you're dispelling myths, which is perfect. That's the whole reason of having these conversations. Like, 
Next time I get bronchitis, maybe I'll go to the dispensary. <laughs> totally. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I'm in Northern California, so it's all legal. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I haven't been to the ones in our new hometown yet, but that's okay. <laughs> so what, tell us a little bit about your business and how, if somebody's interested, they can get in touch with you, work with you, what, what you have to offer. Cause it sounds, sounds amazing. It sounds like we need to definitely share that information. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for asking. Uh, so the business is called trusted Canna nurse. And then that's the website, trustedcannanurse.com. And what we offer is if people are just interested in our products and they just want to know which of our products are right for them, they can book a free product guidance call where they talk to a nurse and then we can guide them through which of our products would be appropriate. And that's for free. Or they can just go online and purchase them without that call. But if they need that guidance, we provide that. If people want a little bit more in-depth consultation where we're looking at medication interactions, we have a board certified pharmacist on staff that can help run interaction checks. And um, you know, if they want us to look at their whole health picture, what else besides cannabis and CBD can we do to like to optimize this person's health? Um, you know, we offer one-on-one -on -one consultations. And then for people who are interested in microdosing programs, like in microdosing psilocybin programs, then we offer, I believe they are eight week programs where um, I have a nurse specialist who does that and she'll, she guides people, holds their hand on their microdosing journey. And then she can facilitate the larger doses too for people who want to like go deeper in their brain and, um, and do the larger doses. I don't know. Going deeper in my brain sounds dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not, it's not for everybody. That's for sure. That's for people who are ready. So <clears throat> I'm assuming the advice that you, you're you supplying to people when if they call and have specific questions is probably a little bit, I'm trying, I'm not trying to be disparaging, but it's probably a little more medically high quality than what the average bud tender at your dispensary yes. is going to be able to tell you. Okay. Yes. Great question. That's a great point. That is definitely what separates us from a bud tender is, you know, bud tenders aren't allowed to give medical advice uh, and we aren't either, but we are educating how this works in the body. And, you know, we have a different level of education than the typical bud tenders. Some are very educated and I'm sure in your, if, you, if you've experienced that as well, some are not, and some don't know what a terpene is. So, that's, you know, that's what we're providing to patients is like nurse level care um, in guiding them on their cannabis and CBD journey. And we know that seniors especially want and need that, that extra hand holding and that extra care. Yeah. It's, it's like a bud tender versus what you guys are doing. It's, it's different services. It's not one's necessarily better than the other. It's just, you know, you wouldn't take mm -hmm. your BMW to the Ford dealership because they're not I mean, they could probably work on it, but you know, we'd be better off at a European or a BMW dealership. Exactly. That's what they yes. specialize in. I don't know why I'm talking about cars, but <laughs> that's a great analogy though. I like that. I'm going to use that. Yeah. It's just, it's just a different, it's just a different flavor of this similar. It's the same service, but different. I don't know. That's <laughs> right. Right. And in California, the market is very recreationally focused. So like where they think everybody just wants to get high or anybody goes to dispensary, like their goal is just to get high. But with seniors, especially that's not the goal. Like people just want to feel better and use a natural and safe product. And, um, but not necessarily, I mean, some want to get high, which is valid, but that's not, that's usually not the goal in what I see in my, my patients. Yeah, that would be, that wouldn't be my goal. Health. Fortunately, I don't have any, any health issues. So I don't, I don't have a need at the moment, but it's nice to know that there's somebody out there versus, you know, like the dispensaries that are close to me. The first time I went to a dispensary, I'm like, they have armed guards outside. It's like, uh, do I want to be here? No, I take that back. That was the first dispensary in California. I did go to one in Colorado. Mm. They didn't have an armed guard outside, but it was, it was in a more, the dispensary near my hometown is like in a warehouse area. In okay. a town, in a town that's having has, and has had a lot of issues for quite a while, <laughs> um, but yeah, it was a little. You know, I'm I'm showing up. You know, blonde mom in my Honda Accord. 
it's like, lady, I think the target's that way. Right. It, was just, <laughs> it was just, it was a little, you know, it was a little unnerving. And then, of course, dopey me tries to pay with my debit card, which is a Visa debit card. They're like, no, you can't do that. I'm like, oh, whoops. Right, right. <laughs> I was like, oh, yeah. I was like, I'm not, I'm not at all clued in on how this works. It's, it's a this, learning curve, isn't it? Yeah. Like when I when I first went, you know, even being younger, like it was really overwhelming for me, like not knowing like what what I'm even looking at. Right. And then the bud tenders are it's somewhat helpful. You know, any bud tender recommending a 10 milligram gummy to a newbie is not safe because that can lead to adverse effects for our patients. So yeah, I, I see where you're coming from. Well that and the the decor was definitely um, not blonde suburban mom, mom in an accord yeah. style. I would, in the, I'm trying to remember the one in in Colorado was a little oh. bit more, less, less Cheech and Chong and more retail establishment. Okay, yeah. Um, that's been a while ago. <laughs> but yeah, and it's like so, you know. And then in the back of your head, you're like, oh, I feel very out of place because I'm not like one of those people. Well, I'm here because I've got shingles and the right, doctor's not helping. Right. <laughs> so yep, yep. it's not, it's nice to know that there's alternatives and I'm really happy that I get to share that with the listeners. Cause like I said, I know many caregivers that use cannabis products for their loved ones, mainly for sleep. I don't know if any of them are using it for agitation or not. If they're getting a good night's sleep. They're probably less agitated. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Yes. Well, I appreciate all of this knowledge and the, the um, website, Trusted Canna Nurse, is hot linked in the show notes. So you guys can just click on that, check it out. You don't have to go to the armed guard Cheech and Chong shop like I did, <laughs> right. which I'm we, sorry. We I know that's you. we I know that's pretty stereotypical, but that's what it felt like the first time. <laughs> they were mm -hmm. great people. So once once you got over the initial, ooh, do I belong here feeling? Um it was it was a good experience but it was it was definitely an experience so mm -hmm. i appreciate this and if anybody has any questions i'm sure they can reach out to you and and absolutely be, yeah. be led and down the right path absolutely yeah and they can follow me on social media i create educational content so just look up trusted canada nurse on instagram facebook youtube TikTok. i have lots of free content there and educational I'll make sure the either Instagram or YouTube are linked in the show notes as well. Better write myself okay. a note. Because <laughs> right. that's always, I liked, uh, that's the kind of like the one minute, the shorts and the reels content that I yeah. like. Something that'll either entertain or educate. So I really appreciate it. Yeah. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your podcasts.